Hey, hey, Art of Likeability family. This week's episode is brought to you by the good folks over at FreshBooks Accountings. They completely updated their software to make it really super simple. So if you need to send out invoices, get paid online, and keep track of your expenses really simply, they got you covered. Go to freshbooks.com slash Aurel. They're going to have a little section that says, how did you hear about us? Make sure to put the Art of Likeability podcast and get a 30-day free trial. Let's jump into this week's episode. Welcome to the Art of Likeability, ranked one of the top podcasts in the world. In this podcast, you'll discover how to leverage likability to build stronger relationships, lead more efficiently, close more sales, and keep customers happy while increasing success in your professional and personal life. Let's jump in with your host, Arel Moody. What's going on, Likeability family? Aurel Moody here, your host of the Art of Likeability podcast, where we teach you the strategies you need to take your life to the next level by building great relationships with others, with yourself. And honestly, if you got a great relationship with yourself and a great relationship with other people, life is pretty good. Think about it. If you are connected, if you are almost super connected to other people at a high level, It doesn't necessarily matter how much money you have in your account, whether it's a lot, whether it's a little. Life is way more meaningful when we have quality relationships. And I am super pumped to welcome our guest today. This dude I've known for a very long time. The dude is incredible. He is, by definition, a super connector. Like his ability to connect people, to support, to help, to create win-wins is something that really, truly is second to none. So when I found out about his new book that was coming out called Super Connector, I was like, dude, you're you're the perfect person to do it. So for those of you who don't know, let me tell you about my guest today named Scott Gerber. So Scott is the CEO of The Community Company. It's an organization that builds and manages community-driven programs for media companies and global brands. He's also the founder of YEC, which is an invitation-only organization comprised of the world's most successful young entrepreneurs. He's also the author of Never Get a Real Job and most recently the author of Super Connector. This dude has been featured, like if you've ever had a TV or read a newspaper, he's been in it. New York Times, Wall Street, Washington Post, Bloomberg, Fortune, Times, CNN, Reuters, Mashable, NPR, Forbes, Entrepreneur. I could go on and on. He's even been honored at the NASDAQ and the White House. This dude is connected to all the right people. So excited to have you on the podcast. Scott, thank you for being here, brother. Thanks so much for having me, Rob. Dude, so now let's let's kind of jump in because you you've been someone that's really built a successful business um, in lots of different arenas, whether I know in the past you've done like restaurants and you've done video editing and then you got into the community building side what was it about building communities that got your attention the most instead of traditional entrepreneurship kind of endeavors totally you know in my first business which i started in college i had made every rookie mistake one can make uh you know spend too much uh, ran it into the ground through operational uh, inefficiencies uh, and, you know, all the different things in between. But what I really realized when I finally took stock in what basically was the defining factor in why I failed, it was the fact I had no inner circle. I had no group of people that truly were best of breed, amazing people that I could have authentic, meaningful conversations with good or bad, rely on people to be there for me, good or bad. Um, And in taking stock and realizing that I didn't have that group around me, um, I sort of made a promise to myself that one day if I would uh, be so successful as to be able to build a group around me like that, um, that I wanted to make sure no other entrepreneurs felt that lonely. Uh, And that eventually, uh, that promise would be fulfilled in the the, uh, form of YEC, which we, you know, built several years later after my next company was successful. But that never, that was never lost on me. The idea that surrounding yourself with a community is the defining factor of success in your life. Uh, And the fact, you know, I'm grateful to my earlier self to have realized at that age that it wasn't about an operational mistake or ego or any of those things. I mean, those things certainly were misfires and dumb decisions, and I've corrected for those as well. 
but the factor was no inner circle, no community. And so I think that's what really excited me the most. And then once we saw what happened with YEC, you know, sort of becoming this organic movement that built, uh, you know, a multi-thousand person community of highly vetted multi-million and multi-billionaire founders uh, all under the age of 45, you know, I, I basically saw with Ryan an opportunity that we could make this bigger not by trying to bastardize YEC by, you know, trying to spend, you know, have people pay more money or, uh, you know, try to, you know, build as many members as we can into one group, but rather be able to take the model that built YEC and begin putting it into these various different organizations that were looking to build community but didn't know where to start, didn't know how to activate them. Uh, and that's what we do with the community company now every day. And it's exciting as hell. You know, what what I find fascinating about your story is there's there's very few people I think, would say, you know what? Psh, I don't need anybody. I'm an island. I mean, we may act like that, whether we, we our actions match our words. You know, a lot of people believe it's the importance of community. But what you've done is you've actually found a way to truly start and be of service and connect with people. And really, like, and I, that's one of the things I really do admire, that you've been able to build just win-wins for everyone. So when people are first trying to build that tribe and that community of people that they can be around that really will make the influence, the biggest question I imagine people have is, well, how do I start? What do I do? And you hear things like be of service and care, but like, how do I actually really start doing it? Well, first you need to audit yourself to determine whether or not you have what I would call a networker mindset. Uh, or a connector mindset. It's not semantics. There is a fundamental difference, um, and so this this will be a good you know uh, a, a test for your for your audience to do. Um, now you don't have to tell the results to anybody, but I would highly recommend you do not lie to yourself uh, that you you do this you know to to really assess which of these two philosophies you live by right now because it'll be a fundamental difference later, and it'll help you to determine foundationally where you need to start to sort of set yourself on the right course to be a community builder. Uh, so first and foremost, the next five professional conversations you have, now these have to be with individuals that you've never met before. So whether you're at an event or you've been introduced to someone, whatever the case may be, the next five people, I want you to consciously take note of one thing. In the first 60 or so seconds of those conversations, I want you to determine, does your mind go in direction A, which is wow, I need to ask this person a follow-up question, or I want to learn more, or here's the next thing I'm going to ask that person. Or does it go in option B, which is this person is or is not valuable to me, therefore I need to either end this conversation or if it's successful, if it's a value opportunity for me, find a way to get the value. Now, Aurel, you being the guy you are, you can obviously tell the difference between those two. Absolutely. The people that are looking for transactional value will lose, always, unequivocally. They will be uh, seen as that icky networker that no one wants to talk to or be around, that nobody wants to build meaningful relationships with. And it's a, it's a self-awareness matter where, from a self-awareness point of view, if you don't realize that that's how people see you, it doesn't matter how self-aware you are as a person, but because you are missing the point. So the first thing is ensuring you have a connector's mindset. Now, let's say you don't. Now, you're going to have to make a decision. Do you want to have a connector's mindset? Because this is not a, you know, drink this Nutra shake and you're going to have a healthy life in five minutes type of crap, right? This is not a tips, tricks, and tactics type of thing. This is a fundamental mindset shift. This is the idea that when you say you want to live a healthy lifestyle, again, you're not going to go drink the shake. Uh, you're going to go and start eating differently, working out, doing physical activity, and change your entire lifestyle. There is no difference if you are looking to build deeper, more meaningful relationships and a community around you, right? It's the same idea. So that's number one. Then once you actually have determined you can go there, the next couple of things you have to determine, again, even before you start meeting and connecting and going out there and introducing and, again, those first couple steps, which we'll get into, the next thing you have to determine is are you empathetic? Are you emotionally intelligent? You know, there's a lot of people that don't like people. <laughs> it sounds funny, but you're probably not going to be a very good connector if you don't like talking to people who either aren't exactly like you or, again, transactionally provide you no value. But you have to be able to 
love people and be curious and know that not every conversation is going to lead to some riches or some value extraction, but rather context that's going to help you to develop deeper relationships with those you choose to invest your time in. So that's the next thing. Are you emotionally intelligent and empathetic? Can you be curious? Can you care and love other people? And then finally, if you are those things, uh, and if you're, you're not those things, I highly suggest there's a lot of different things you can read about emotional intelligence and other things out there. You can also read about it in our book. Um, then the next thing is where do you get started? So we talk about in the book a lot of different psychological things you have to, to know. Like, for example, you know, you should be selective. You know, you don't want to just go with a big mistake as everybody assumes a super connector. There's an extrovert type A, walks into a conference, tries to meet every single person, walk out with a thousand business cards. Nothing could be farther from the truth. That is a networker. That is someone who is literally trying to uh, operationalize personal gain. A connector is selective. They are determining the palms they live in the real estate they're going to play in, the conversations they're going to curate, and the people they're going to convene. Right? Everything they do is methodical. It doesn't mean it's Machiavellian by any chance. It just means they're putting real thought into it. So it's not just, for example, as a first step, I'm going to go and attend 50 meetups. Right? Rather, it's I'm going to research, let's say, a conference that is perfect for the kinds of people I want, but then I'm going to do deeper research into the exact people that are attending that conference. I'm gonna send them personal invitations to a safe space or an oasis that I'm gonna create, whether that's a a, a five person coffee table, a 20 person drinks at a private venue, whatever the case is, something basic. I'm gonna tell them why they should be there. I'm gonna remove friction uh, from the people uh, meeting one another that are going to be at that smaller oasis by asking them what's a challenge they're facing right now or what is something that uh, they're, they're very strong in that they can help others with. And then I'm going to syndicate that information to all 15, 20 participants so that instantly I'm seen as the sphere of influence, the host, the curator. I don't have to meet you all one-on-one, but I can eavesdrop and listen to all conversations simultaneously to know who I'm going to invest in building a longer relationship with. I've created the safe space that's valuable for everyone that people are looking for at these larger activities. And what did I spend next to nothing? You know, it's, it's had a better chance of building real value. It's interesting because I recently um, have come across this idea, which I thought was very brilliant, which is the idea of the big domino, that there's one big domino that if you knock that domino over, all other little dominoes fall down because of it. And I think what you said is like very big domino like that you don't just go to a thousand events, which are little dominoes. You say, what's the most important one for me to be at? Who are the most important people? And then creating that almost oasis, which I love that word, by the way, where it's like five to 10 people. And when you're putting that together, that that the oasis, just so people can conceptualize it, who maybe have never heard it before, go a little bit deeper into, so let's say I'm someone who's like, all right, I really want to get into tech. I'm making this up. There's going to be a a really cool event. There's going to be a bunch of, you know, high powerful people and I want to meet people. What would an oasis strategy or, or mindset look like? Sure. So first I'm going to determine whether I have any anchors uh, or fellow connectors uh, that are already sort of in that world. Right. And I'm going to first invite my anchors around me. Right. Because it's all about first having an inner circle and inner circles. It's real time. It takes real time to build those real relationships. Um, So I tell everybody here that, you know, there's going to be uh, a time when you're just investing in people uh, or the people you're investing in. You know, it's 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 a long term opportunity. It's a long term lens. And so, you know, you want to be investing in people also that are going to be strong inner circle players of yours. And again, that doesn't necessarily mean they have to be billionaires or millionaires. That's another misconception. Most inner circle participants are just people that really have your back. It could be your local accountant. It doesn't matter. It's the point that it's the people that vouch for you, would be there for you, that you for them, and that you could be your most authentic self with in front of or behind closed doors with that individual. So that's the first thing. Do you have any anchors that are going to help to wedge the fact that this oasis is valuable to others to say, like, look, who's going to be attending this thing we're going to do? Okay. number two, when you are talking about bringing people together, you want to make sure that the room is curated with a series of sort of criteria. Now, it doesn't mean it has to be stated criteria, but it has to be a certain level of values, for example. And I'm going to go both directions here. 
you could, with your tech analysis, uh, it could literally be that these are all junior associates, okay, for venture capital or seed firms, not the asso- not the main managing partners, but you invite all the associates. Why? Because the value to the individuals in the room could be that these are the people that one day they're going to start a fund with. These are the people that are the direct links, the pyramid of influence that affect who the managing partners are going to look at, right? And so it doesn't always have to be the people. In fact, most cases, we make the mistake of going after the Richard Branson, but not Richard Branson's, you know, uh, mother's best friend's uncle, right, who happens to run one of his subsidiaries, right? We don't we don't go the route of the non-sexy because we've been, uh, you know, sort of uh, rosy colored glasses over us to think that the hype and personal brand of individuals is why they need to be the ones that we're connecting with. It's wrong. It's the people that influence those people that matter. So again, now you're going to have, let's say, these junior associates. You can go the other direction and say it's all tech founders who just raised their first seed round and want to talk about, you know, what are they actually going through in their business? Everybody's at the same level, right? Everybody can talk through their challenges and closed door. And regardless of which way you go, you can then make sure that you, like I said, are making a frictionless environment. You're going to ask a lot of questions before anybody attends, okay? You're going to make it clear there's no agendas here. You're not selling anything. You're just looking to build great relationships with people that could be providers of information or could exchange value uh, in the form of lessons learned and history, right? Um, But by asking questions about where they're expert, where they're not, what are they working on right now? What is something that a, a group of people at the same level or others in the field could help them achieve? And syndicating that information, you've basically gotten people into a room now, and they know everyone that's there from a high surface level, but it's enough surface level to go deeper. Well, if you really want to be a master connector, then the next thing is, where are people sitting? What environment are they in? Why are they in that environment? Do you sit people next to each other methodically? There's all kinds of things you can do to remove further friction. But at its most simplistic, you know, phase one junior level stuff, you need to become a convener of amazing people. Amazing does not mean rich. Amazing does not mean chief executive. Amazing does not mean they're going to give you a magic check by doing a service for them. It just means that you're going to surround yourself with your definition of amazing people that can all be mutually benefiting one another, but you are seen as the sphere of influence in the middle that sort of made it happen. And then after the event leaves, after it's over, you're going to make sure that the people that should have met met. You're going to follow up and say, hey, I'm going to do more of these in the future. Any advice? Hey, would you want to attend something else? Hey, is there anything you know that, that you didn't feel like you got out of this? Because you're also going to be assessing your own value, your own ability to curate, and your own ability, uh, which I think is most unique, to introduce and to convene. But if you master this over time, and again, let me be clear to your whole audience, Ralph, this is a decade-long thing that my partner and I have mastered with tens of thousands of people, hundreds of events, all kinds of things that we've learned, the people should be prepared to realize, like I started this whole conversation with you with, this is not one, two, three. This is not five minute abs formula. This is long-term lens, lifestyle, mindset shifting. But if you do it, the value is incredible. So, you know, I love how one formulaically uh, if that's a word, I don't know if formulaically is an is a adjective, but in, in, a, in a very formula way, you kind of broke that down. And what I love about it, too, is that idea of people want to go after the Richard Branson, the sexy guy, but that's the one who gets pitched a billion times. But it's that other person, that that sphere of influence that no one knows about. Like, you know, people don't know about Charlie Munger. They know about Warren Buffett, you know? Mm-hmm. It's a really, really great strategy. Now, my question to you is when you're looking at creating the oasis let's say you're going to an event you want to create your own little like uh sub oasis within the event it's great to have an anchor what if you don't like is it weird Mm -hmm. to reach out to someone and be like hey scott i know you don't know me but i'm getting about five people together for drinks do you want to come or do you sound like a creeper how do you not be a creeper well there's steps to take even before that again You know, I think what we've seen is that the people who ultimately are creating the most value as conveners and curators of experience and opportunity uh, are those that were active participants first in other communities, right? Or people that have joined other like-minded professionals or individuals. uh, And, you know, whether it be a local chamber of commerce, whether it be, again, a local tech meetup, they were methodical about what 
places they put their time in initially to start figuring out who they wanted to build relationships with, but they were very active participants. Now, why would they be active participants of someone else's community? Well, like everything else, people at the top of a community, like myself and Ryan in the case of YEC, uh, or people that say own Ivy, or people that own you know, a BNI group, or EO chapter, or whatever it is, the host, or the owner, or the uh, main curator, convener of these activities care deeply about these communities. So when you're an active participant in a meaningful way, going out of your way to help, or engage in meaningful dialogue, give opinions, whether it's contrarian or actually good opinion uh, or mainstream opinion. Whatever the case may be, you are standing out with someone who is very much an active, uh, engaged individual, which gets the attention or allows you to get the attention, if you are proactive about it, of the conveners themselves. This helps you to develop your anchors, right? So if you all of a sudden start going to a local chamber of commerce event, you know, and you know the president of the chapter, and you develop a relationship with that convener, that all of a sudden can become your anchor. But it's because you've shown them that you've taken great care with their own community, right? You can communicate and facilitate a lot of value with your own unique perspective. And it doesn't matter if you're a college kid or if you're you know, recent grad or 50 years old post-executive. The reality is everybody has value to deliver. If you can help to make your value clear, whatever that value may be, whether it's experience and you know, anecdotal evidence, whether it's a certain skill set, um, when you can sound off and be meaningful to others, they take note, they become part of the first sort of layer of your network, eventually perhaps an inner circle player. And then those folks are the ones that you're going to anchor off of for future opportunities. Again, all of this takes time, effort, and real love and care. Um, there's an old saying, and it's in the book, uh, you know, my first real mentor said to me when I tried to, you know, she was somebody who was a power broker that like worked with all the big names, talking about like Richard Branson's and all this. And, you know, I asked her all the time, Holly, how do I get where he was, you know, 25 years ago, where he is now? How do I do it in two years? How do I do it in five weeks, right? It's always trying to hack and growth hack and convert and all that crap that we should be throwing away. That's what I thought too. And she said something that was profound, which was real relationships take real time and you can't cheat real time. So it's when people, when people are looking at that, I think that that's the point where people get held up. They start saying things like, but I'm trying to I'm start I'm trying to start my business now. I'm trying to grind now. I'm trying to go now. I, I can't waste yeah. my time with a bunch of people who are gonna waste my time. But in essence, that's already the flawed thinking. Is that what you're saying? Correct. Oh, hundred percent. I think that people that don't understand uh, that we don't live in a Facebook ad conversion world in the real world. And the real world, by the way, means both online and offline relationships, but you can't growth hack your way to succeed in this. That doesn't mean it's going to take every person you meet a hundred years to be able to build value, but habitual givers, conveners, empathetic people are the ones who win. And it does take time. And the second you sort of break the code and go transactional, you're going to lose favor. Here, I'll give you the perfect example. Everybody in your audience can identify with this. And Aurel, I, I think you personally could probably identify with this better than anyone. You've met thousands and thousands of people over the years. Your first reaction when you know someone is network hustling you, what do you think of that person? <laughs> right. Usually I think, um, you know, I wish them the best, but I don't know if I'm going to be the best person to help them. Correct. So instantly, whether and you're nice about it in that you at least let them off easy. Right. Most people just give the like, oh, God, why am I? God, I got to get out of this. And so the people that are trying to cheat real time by getting you know through directly to you and cutting the corners and trying to like get something. And it's so obvious. Right. It's a cheap suit trick. They're going to fail. So my argument to the one you just gave to the person, let's say, that says, well, I don't have time. I'm grinding now and all this. I'll say this. If you were to aggregate all of the failed attempts against the one long term, I will bet you you are talking about equal wastes of time, quote unquote, or equal time. And so the reality is, wouldn't you rather better spend that time on an exercise that actually works? because you can just either destroy your reputation person for person trying to grind it and get what you need every single time or you can be an authentic human being and realize that not everybody is going to care instantly about the what you do before they know who you are 
And that's the difference. So when people are trying to say, let's not say trying, when people then say, all right, you know, Scott, what you're saying is making sense because I've met a ton of people. Because also what I love to tell people is think about how you feel if someone's trying to be transactional in nature with you. Like, hey, I sell life insurance. Here's my card. You know, I can give you some really great life insurance. You're like, dude, where's this coming? You wouldn't like it, but we do it to others and we think it's different. Yep. Yep. But but when when we start saying to ourselves, okay, Scott, I do want to focus on being a a connector and not a networker. I do want to focus on it. I think the stopping point for a lot of people would be, how do I know who are the right people? How do I, like, what kind of research am I doing so that I can figure out these are the kinds of people that are worth my time, that are my quote unquote big domino kind of people? Is there any advice you can give so that people don't go, I get it in theory, but I don't know how to do this in practice? Just wanted to take a quick break from our interview to let you know about our super awesome sponsor of this episode, which is FreshBooks. It's a super cool accounting software. Now, let me tell you about something that's really important. If you want to create more time and you want more of your time back, whether you're a creative, a freelancer, a small business owner, you need to make sure that you have your accounting up to date so you can take advantage of all those great tax savings and get it done easy. FreshBooks makes cloud accounting software for creative professionals that's so straightforward to use, you save hours every week and have more time to create the things you love. Yeah, it's got a lot of features. I mean, FreshBooks is off the chain with their new platform. I can't get into all of them, but think about this just for a quick little what's up. You can send an invoice in under 30 seconds that's branded with your stuff, enable online payments in two clicks, and keep track of everything with your phone or automate your cards to your accounts. Super simple. Super easy. So if you're use if you're not using FreshBooks yet, go to freshbooks.com slash Aurel. In the how did you hear about us section, put the art of likability. You can get a 30-day free trial, no credit card or anything required, and you'll get 30 days free from freshbooks.com slash Aurel. In the how did you hear about us section, put the art of likability. I got you back. They got you back. Let's get back to the interview. Absolutely. Look, I mean, you have to be selective. And, and there's no question you can't, you know, if you look at Adam Grant's book, Give and Take, right? Uh, they ha- he has a pyramid in, in the book and uh, he talks about the most successful and the least successful people on that period, uh, pyramid are both the same kind of uh, theoretical person. They're both givers. But the difference is that the people that are failed givers on the bottom uh, do not prioritize their own success and are habitually giving to the point where it's like an addiction where they're just trying to do it with everybody and anyone. So they're doing it ineffectively without productivity, without systems, without thought, just because they just want to just help everyone. And that's not a good thing either. So first thing that most people should know, uh, connectors are incredibly selective. They're incredibly efficient at productivity hacking, right? You can't hack relationships, but you can hack your time to ensure there's enough of it in exercises you want to do to build those relationships in the time you do have, right? Um, and so I think that the most important thing when you're you know, thinking about uh, how to surround yourself with the right people initially, you know, in the research you're doing and so forth is, you know, truly ask people. We talk about in the book this thing called the smart ask. Most people do really horrible asks, right? They'll be like, hey, Aurel, do you know uh, the, the guy who's the CEO of that company? <laughs> right, right. And you're just like, what does that, what does that mean? Like, <laughs> okay, yeah, maybe, or what? And then it's like, oh, well, can you introduce me? And it's like, there's no context, there's no thinking, the person might not even be right, right? Mm-hmm. We don't do a lot of smart asking. And so one of the biggest things that connectors do is they methodically think through their asks. They ask people about their asks. They get people they trust to help them craft the asks that those people ultimately might actually be able to facilitate. Right? They don't just go in and lose their reputational capital by just trying to say, oh, hey, I need to meet this person. Can you make it happen? Right? And so what do I mean by that in, in you know, the real specific terms? If you are someone who is like, all right, I have to go and figure out you know, for my specific business, who are the kinds of people that I should meet for this specific skill set or for this specific challenge or to be able to bounce these kinds of big ideas off of, right? Well – The first thing is you're going to go to people that you do trust and you're going to start a conversation. You're going to be a Sherlock Holmes of discourse a little bit here. You're going to start asking questions and saying, look, if this was the challenge you had in your business, this is you asking a friend, a colleague, another member of your inner circle, again, an accountant, a lawyer, everybody has someone. Okay, If you have no one, 
then, then there's a bigger issue here. Everyone has access to someone you can have one conversation with, a high school friend, a college student, a college mentor, whatever it is, right? doesn't mean that every time it's going to be a home run, but it's the starting point that gets you down the path of honing these skill sets. And you're going to ask questions. If this was the challenge you were facing, or if this was the kind of people that you wanted to be able to connect with around these big ideas, or whatever the case may be, how would you think about the kinds of people you would want to connect with? Okay, um, and let's get their feedback. Follow up with more questions. Go deeper. Learn. Listen, and then be able to craft your ask. And when you ask enough people you trust, you get a sense of your own opinion on it. And then you're able to either make an ask, or the people that ultimately are the ones you were, you know, shooting back and forth with on making the ask might be the ones to actually help take it to the next level. Because the most important thing that you want to do is ensure that the time you are going to spend in crafting your ask to get to the answers you need is, you know, is, is just well thought through. Um, I think that at the end of the day, I would start, if I have to go really, really granular here, I would start with, you know, lawyers, accountants, service professionals in business, especially in small towns, because they know everyone. Right. That's their job to know everyone. Now, it doesn't mean every lawyer is a good lawyer and every accountant is loved by everyone in the town. So you got to be have enough awareness to have reputation in mind. But they're also looking to always develop new relationships, too, and cultivate those relationships in local environments. Same thing with the president of a local business group. Right. Because they want to be able to keep that environment, keep that ecosystem going. So usually those are good starting points. But there's always a way in. You have to be smart. You have to be methodical. And most importantly, and I just, you know, I say this as if it's, it's got to be said, unfortunately, just be yourself. You know, don't try to put on some personal brand mask. Don't try to be smarter than you are. Don't try to sound like you're like, a, you know, an intellectual when really five words will do in regular middle school grammar. You know, these kinds of things are going to be the difference of how you're going to get to the initial kinds of folks that can be incredibly valuable to make your life more rewarding and eventually to, for you to make their lives more rewarding. Yeah, so then, so what happens then is that somebody will say, yo, that's a great idea. I'm going to go to um, the lawyer. I never thought about it, but that makes sense. They have connections. Let me build relationships. They walk into the office and they say, hey, Mr. Lawyer, I want to connect with you. How can I help you? Which is like the worst question ever. Worst question ever. Right. right? Well, you just, you, <laughs> so how do they have that conversation, right? Yeah. So there's a lot of different ways to connect. Now, connect doesn't always mean trying to figure out a way to help someone. It can also just mean picking the right kinds of people to have thoughtful mentorship conversations. It could mean, you know, getting, giving a sense of where you can play a role from conversation and then suggesting it. Like, this is what I love, Arel, about that crappy question, how can I help you? Other than it's become such a social script, it's horrible, right? Um, but the reality is, is that in theory, if you've been talking to someone for 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes, shouldn't you know how potentially to help me? <laughs> you know? Right, I'm right. Listening. Like, why do you have to ask me that? It almost like destroys everything you've said prior. Mm. But let's change up the dynamic a little bit of how you would do this, right? Now, again, not every person you're going to reach out to is going to is going to get back to you. And there's we talk in the book all different ways that you can do sort of cold open style emails and communications and so forth. The first and best is always who is someone that you know in your world that can get you in front of for a simple meeting that lawyer, right? And if especially you're a young person, like I know a lot of the people that listen to you speak around, you have a leg up as a student or a recent college grad. People want to give back. And so your ability to be able to get the kinds of people around you gets a lot simpler. It's a lot easier equation. So, you know, in, in terms of getting involved, somebody introduces you or whatnot, you don't go in there and say, hey, how can I help you? You're going to say, tell your story, right? The best connectors are storytellers. Here's my thing. I went to this school. I felt like I learned a lot, but not enough. The areas that I'm deficient in are A, B, and C. I want to start this business. I know a lot about this part of it, but not this part of it. And the parts that I don't know, I'm looking to meet people that do know these three or four specific items. And I'm looking to meet people that can help me either with information that I could you know, learn and do, uh, or that might know some folks that would also welcome a 10, 15 minute conversation to allow me to ask these questions. And if they don't have 15 minutes, a quick email, a Skype call, whatever is convenient to that individual. Okay. Does that make sense? Can you help me with that? Is that something that you'd be able to do? Mm -hmm. Right. 
these kinds of things, just more thoughtful ways of asking, but giving the context. We forget the context because we're talking in headlines today. That's all we do. Right? Yeah. We talk about the goal. We don't talk. We talk about Steve Jobs being the greatest man ever created, ever alive, ever done. But we don't talk about the fact that he went through hell and back for 25 years to get that status. Mm. That's the difference. Yeah, you know, it's so funny because um, so recently I started uh, running some some Instagram ads to teach people. We're doing an online master class to teach people about how to become a professional speaker. So if anyone's interested who's listening, you go to truespeakingsuccess.com slash masterclass. It's free. It's awesome. So I ran the ad and then I would get tons of people who would DM me, um, which is fine. But a lot of people would be like, hey, man, what's your phone number? I want to call you. And I'm like, there's zero context. Like, you're just reaching out and saying, jump on the phone with me. And it's like, one, why would I jump on the phone with you? I have no idea who you are and no idea why. And they're like, yo, give me a number. I want to call you. I got some cool ideas. What ideas? Who are you? Why are you doing that? Like, it blew my mind that so many people had that approach. They're just doing it wrong. Being told, hustle, hustle, hustle. And you got to make it work. And all this other rah, rah crap. That is very far from the reality of how business relationships start, right? I mean, like, for example, Rel, they went to you and they said, hey, listen, you know, even if they said, look, I, I don't know if I want to be a professional speaker yet. Are there any other resources you have that I can look at to see if perhaps this is an avenue for me, right? Then right. your chances of responding being the kind of guy you are, very high, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's like, all right, I can maybe get someone, you know, into this world, get them clear. But I love that. I, Ryan and I talk about this extensively in the book of why most connectors, the best connectors in the world, say no, right? M many more times than yes. And it's because of exactly what you just said. There's not a week that goes by where Ryan and I won't get an email that's like, would love to work with you. Let's find 15 minutes. On what? Do you want to sponsor us? Do you want to partner with us? What Do you have a service you want to sell to us? Because, you know, partner today has become the new buzzword. <laughs> I want to sell you shit, right? so, so, but, that's, but, you know, but that's the kind of thing. And it's because we're thinking like salespeople, like networkers, like transactional people, because that's what we've been told converts. You email 5,000 people and you're going to get a 1% conversion rate and you're just plugging away. You're manufacturing on the assembly line those introductions, those opens, those whatever. And for the people that are thoughtless, that maybe are just the one-offs, like what you were just talking about, they need to get set straight. And here's the thing. There's a great article written uh, on uh, Entrepreneur by the editor-in-chief, uh, Jason. Uh, recently, he actually had this exact experience happen where someone asked him for generic help. And he wrote, you know, sorry, I'm not going to be able to do this and explain why. Because in his, philosophy, in his mind, no – was the best possible yes of information, of value he could have given to this person. The person wasn't ready for a conversation. And he got murdered on LinkedIn. He posted like the, the whole thing and people were like sounding off so many comments and posts and all this stuff saying, how dare you? Like, and it's if, it's if to say how many people, that, that's not telling of, of Jace doing something right or wrong, even though he was very much to the right. What it's telling of is how much the networking norms, how much the culture uh, of headline clickbait has gotten to us. That mm. people think you should just stop whatever you're doing or that someone's going to literally, because you read a mentorship article, five tips to get your perfect mentor, that you are going to literally be able to email Richard Branson and Gary V and all these people and they're going to get back to you and they're going to help you with your career and it's going to be storybook and life is great. Guess what, friends? That's a bunch of crap. All of it. Every part of it. You've been locked, socked, and, st and basically put into the clickbait world thinking that you can gain someone's attention beyond a like, a share, or something else. There's a time and place for that. That's advertising. Okay? This is not marketing and advertising. And if you treat it like marketing and advertising, you will fail. Period. And full stop. So let's take, for example, um, someone who goes, oh, man, Scott, I've been reading a bunch of these articles about I should have reached out to 500 people. I only need five of them to say yes. And then my life changes because one, that person also anyone who is of influence, they receive a lot of messages and they can tell if a message is templated. Right. Yep. Like if you're sending me an email and it says, hi, sir or madam. It's immediately, I'm not reading it. Um, yeah. If I get an email that sounds personal, but at the bottom of the email, there's a blue unsubscribe link, 
I'm not responding to it because you know, I know you're just pounding the pavement. You don't like, I get tons of people reach out to me, say they want to be on the podcast, but I can tell their pitch is a hundred percent generic and they're just copy and pasting and going down the line. And it's like, it's not even a good fit for what we do. And I don't, you know, so there's, there's so many people that buy into that, that pound the pavement, pound the pavement. So let's say we were going to create this hypothetical situation and I'm going to create Scott Gerber with all the knowledge Scott Gerber has right now, except you have none of the connections and none of the success that you have. All the knowledge you have, none of the names. If someone Googles you, there's nothing that shows up. And you want to get in with this really awesome um, business owner in your city. Like this dude is a rock star. He's amazing. And you're like, all right, I'm going to start super connecting. Walk me through what that might look like from your perspective. I'm going to blow your mind, Darrell. You ready for this? Ready. So a lot of the connectors in the book talk about this exact thing of how do you break through, but just in the simplistic ways of actually showing people your humanity. Again, remember, my whole argument here is that social media, technology, emails, these things have bastardized our humanity, right? Because we're playing to the strengths of the platform instead of the platform amplifying the humanity, which was the original intent, right? You even see with Facebook now how they have to do a huge about face because it's gotten so bastardized that they have to take it back to its original intent, right? So what I would do is very simple. I would do something that cannot be gamed. And here's what it is. I would literally record a 30 second video to this person, showing them exactly why I felt that they were someone I would love to connect with and why the value I think that they bring their information to basically make it stupidly clear that this is not your one of 50 people I'm shooting a video for. That two, this is something that is you know truly meaningful to me. And three, making it clear the role they've played on my thinking. So it's not just, hey, I read an article, but it's, you know, I read this article about you and then I did a lot of research. I read your book. I saw in chapter five, page four, you know, that there was this particular area that just, just blew me away. I've been thinking about it for days, telling all my friends, you know, uh, I, and, and I just I need to know if you can give me, you know, 15 minutes or an email or whatever works for you, you know, just a little more context around this because I'm looking to build this thing. And that was life changing. You get my point, right? Like it's making it a clear amplification of your humanity. And I could go farther to say, OK, that I would even figure out who his assistant is. I would gift something to the assistant. With a DVD or with a CD or with an MP, with an MP, uh, MPEG file, something to make sure that it got in front of that person. There's things you can do. This is not impossible. We talk a lot about these kind of uh, framework type tools in the book that, again, are not meant gospel. I, I'm not telling everybody here go go shoot a 30 second video, right? But it's an example of of a of a larger point, which is I don't like when people tell me, "Oh, Scott, you're just so successful. That's the reason you can do all this. That's the reason you can." you know, get this person on the phone. Well, guess what? I didn't start there. <laughs> you know, I, my mom was a school teacher. My dad was a salesperson. Okay. I went to film school. You want to talk about somebody who's doing the absolute opposite of what was intended? You're looking and hearing them, folks. So the reality is this is doable, but let's not forget, I've been at it for 10 years. Now that might scare a lot of you because you don't want to wait 10 years. Maybe you'll have to wait one, one year for your best relationship two years for your second best relationship, then two months after that, you have your third. A month after that, you have your fourth, and every week you have your fifth, sixth, and seventh. But it just doesn't necessarily work on a timeline. But you have to be prepared for that. Yeah, and you- If you want to hustle, that's cool. I'm all for it. But just do it in a human way that shows your best you. Yeah, and what I love about what you're saying here, and it's so important, I just want to emphasize it a little bit here. I get tons of people who say, Hey, Rel, love your podcast. Da, 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 da. But they never say, oh, I liked this episode or I love how you said this or like that little detail when you're reaching out to someone instead of saying, oh, hey, I read your book. It was awesome, Scott. Blah, 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 blah. Like, how do I know? Like, do you think that generic thing me like that's so important, especially that video? It's personal. 
it's clearly showing you've done your research and that alone will separate you from 99% of all outreaches. I mean, Arel, I'll give a perfect example, okay? Like, so anybody that sees the book is going to see that the forward was written by Keith Ferrazzi. So for anybody that uh, doesn't know who Keith Ferrazzi is, uh, I would argue he is the godfather of the super connector idea. Yeah. Like he wrote about it in his book, Never Eat Alone, about 10, 15 years ago. And that book has been a multi bit New York Times bestseller for, for a long time. Now, Keith and I have met several times over the years, but I would never have said we were incredibly close. Um, I respect him immensely. Uh, and, you know, obviously he, he respected me just from afar, right? We, we, we maybe met in person two, maybe three times over the last 10 years. When I wanted him to write the foreword, even though I believe, and I don't want to put words in Keith's mouth, uh, that he would have taken a phone call, he would have taken an email, like, you know what I mean? I wanted to put my best foot forward. So even though, oh, look how quote unquote successful Scott is and quote unquote successful Ryan is, I did exactly what I just told your audience. I shot a one minute video. I explained exactly the impact Keith had on my life, that his book Never Eat Alone specifically changed the way that I thought about relationships at a very pivotal moment right after my company at the time had failed and how I had taken exact lessons from that to be able to build YEC that then turned into a much larger business. And so he got back to me within dates just because he was touched and that he realized he had really made an impact on me. Now, not every video you're going to send to someone is because they have a massive impact on you, but you get the point. I'm preaching here what I do. Because it works, guys. You know, at the end of the day, my biggest, I hate giving tips and tricks. I've been down that road. I've, you know, this is like I said the whole time. It's mindset. It's framework. It's a logic set. It's not do these five things to be successful. But the best, I guess, advice that I could give everyone here at the end of the day is I'm not wrong about one thing. And that is real relationships take real time. You're not going to cheat it, even though you think you will. You might cheat your time to maximize it through productivity. We talk a lot about systems and the ways you can, quote unquote, cheat your time in the sense of your time, but not relationship time. Like, how do you get 10 people in a room instead of one to do, you know, 10 coffee meetings at the same time instead of 10 individual one hour coffee meetings, right? Things like that that can cheat the, quote unquote, time that you actually need to spend as an exercise. But the relationship building doesn't change. Okay, that that's key. But you're not going to cheat this. You could say right now, listening to this podcast, oh, well, you know, uh, I'm I'm, I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. It works. I'm going to keep sending a thousand emails to get three meetings. I'm going to keep pumping phone calls with outbound uh, until somebody picks up the phone. More power to you. I'm not here to judge you. I'm just here to tell you that as someone who literally has connected or introduced or worked with well over 20,000 world-class C-suite executives, your thought process is flawed. And if those people have gotten there, if you can ask anyone in any business or any type of level at the highest level of success in business, what is the most valuable thing to them? They will all say the same thing in some way or another. And that is the relationships they've built. So I I would almost go to say in a very almost contrarian perspective that what you're saying is actually the fastest way to success. Yeah. Though it seems like the slowest. Yeah, it's it, because it's authenticity to, you know, which has become also the new T-shirt, right? But the real sense of authenticity, you know, you're, you're, you think of it this way, well, we talked a couple times in this podcast about the idea of, you know, somebody says, like, I, I do the similar question with marketers. Marketers will tell me all the time, like, oh, yeah, we do these things to convert and so forth. And then I turn around on them and I'm like, well, if you're the consumer, would you buy? And the answer is no, because I know it's marketing, right? It's the same. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. Incredibly, right? Because it's not, well, it's me. No, you know, I know the game. Well, welcome to the conversation, right? Um, but that's the thing, man. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, the way to reverse engineer success is not necessarily finding ways to cheat the way to get there. It's just to use the most efficient way to get there at the highest level in the most areas you can possible, right? Mm. So when you have to cheat a 24-hour day because we all have the same amount of time and we can't get back, it's how you spend that time and who you spend it with and the ways in which you slice that time that are ultimately going to be the differentiator of whether this takes a year or 10 years, right? But if the same thing goes with the marketer question, I'm going to ask your audience this question. 
You're somebody emails you out of the blue and says, Hey, would love to be your best friend. I know we've never met, you know, I, I, I know that, you know, we're Facebook buddies from like three years ago, but let's just start being best friends. Okay. Sound good. <laughs> right. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's the craziness of this because it's just not that different when you're asking someone, Hey, I know that you've built reputational capital over two decades, you know, built a company from zero to $60 million, been through a hell and back, but you know what? I'm me. So can you just do me a favor and just expedite my path to success? <laughs> right. But that's the same thing, right? Right. It, you're, you're, you're not cherishing the other side's story, history, learnings, anecdotal evidence, factual evidence, actual time from their families, things that matter over many, many, many years, millions of conversations, because you think I'm going to grind it. Mistake. Huge mistake. And you're going to be wasting your most precious hours on activities that turn people off, that will close doors to you forever, because by the time you turn yourself around, those doors will not be open to you again. Right. And, you know, when you when you start really looking at the ask side of it, it's actually empowering and I think not disempowering when you start thinking, if I'm going to contact a successful person or I want to have people come with me, uh, in my Oasis event at an actual event, they're not spending time with their family. They're not spending time with their kids. Like, Scott, you have, how many kids do you have now? Four? Four kids. Right, four kids, beautiful wife. She's very successful at what she does. If I say, Scott, hang out with me, you have to consciously say, I am not hanging out with my family to be here. Correct. So it has to be something that's more than just give me your ear or let me try to sell you something because that that's a lose situation. Absolutely. And again, you know, I, I just think people don't put other people's priorities or time in mind. If they're making this kind of mistake, they're only putting their own. And I think if you reverse the, you know, equation and listen to the other side and actually think about the other side's needs, you're going to realize real quick how wrong you've been. Right. And I think that alone is is amazing. And, and, and what I love about what you you do is not only are you really sharing the philosophical side of it, you're breaking down the the step by step. And I'm sure there's a lot of people that are listening to this saying, oh, my God, I need to re-listen to this podcast, you know, five times. The good news is all of this is written down in, in the book, The Super Connector, which the tagline, which I love is stop networking and start building business relationships that matter. So tell people more. I know you've referenced it, but tell me more about the book, where people can get it, and, and what's the deal with, yep. with that? Yeah, so you know, I think you're getting the gist that Ryan and I, uh, my co-author and partner in the community company and the co-founder uh, of YAC, you know, have been in this sort of community building world now for about a part of a decade. And we have just seen firsthand, both through our own efforts and those of the other sort of top connectors and conveners around the world, what it takes to actually build relationships that last and produce mutual value and, and really are what make life worth living. And we believe that the networking construct, the networker thinking, is still what's prevalent in the mainstream. And so this is our moment to sort of, you know, combine all these incredible intellectual thoughts with practical knowledge and framework and mindset thinking uh, into one compilation. You know, take all the best people that we respect and actually get their thoughts down in writing so that people can make a determination of, is this something I want to pursue or not? Again, I don't judge people on their actions. I just know what works for us and what's worked for countless people who I believe you, after reading the book or looking who's involved, will absolutely respect. Uh, and so that's what the book is about. Uh, you can pick it up anywhere books are sold. You can go to superconnectorbook.com, learn a little bit more, see what people uh, like John Paul DeJoria, Barbara Corcoran, Lewis Howes, the former CEO of Forbes, others have said about the book. So you can see from the people that you probably do respect or at least respect where they, you know, where they come from or what they work and what they do, uh, you know, what they think of the book. Uh, and then let us know what you think. You can follow Ryan and myself either at Scott Gerber or at Ryan Paw. His last name is uh, P-A-U-G-H. Uh, and keep the conversation going on Twitter, you know. We really wrote this book, uh, you know, not to, quote unquote, make millions of dollars on selling books. I mean, that would be lovely. I'm not going to lie. I'm a capitalist. But really because we care deeply about this topic and subject matter. And we've just seen firsthand what makes the difference. And 
Hopefully you'll pick up a copy and you'll start to see how you can make the difference in your own life, in your own business, and really reset your priorities around being a connector and not a networker. Yeah, and if you're someone who likes audiobooks, I actually bought the audiobook version of it. So you can get, you know, the written form, the Kindle form, the audiobook. is It's really worth getting this information into your head because when you really get it, I really believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that we're all just one relationship away from changing our life. There's a person who can introduce you. There's a person you might marry. There's a person who might become a business partner. If you're doing it the wrong way, you're never going to have that deep relationship. So you can do the Oasis strategy. You can do the stop the transactional um, experience and start looking to how you can help when you're reaching out to people, removing the churn of let me do 5,000 generic emails to get a 1% response rate because people aren't percentages, they're, they're people. Doing actual research. You can do videos and send it to them to let them know that they care. When you do ask, make sure it's not a generic ask that you're giving context behind it so people understand how they can support you. Be very honest with where you are at your time and most people actually will will respect that. You know, you've, you've given an incredible amount of tangible and, and philosophical strategies. Is there one question that when you get interviewed and you're talking about super connecting that maybe you feel like it doesn't get asked enough or there's a question that you're like, you know, everyone kind of goes here, but they're not really seeing how really deep or how all interconnected this is. And I'd love to bring it up, yeah. but it doesn't naturally come up or it's hard to fit in. Is there anything that you kind of wish that you could talk about in the realm of super connecting that maybe doesn't naturally bring itself to the forefront of the conversation? Great last question, Earl. Um, and there is. And, you know, it sounds funny. We talk a lot about these lofty ideals, about relationship building, connecting. But we forget sometimes uh, in these conversations to talk about the one thing that unfortunately matters to most people. I have to eat. I have to put a roof over my head. I have to pay the bills, right? So this all sounds great. and It sounds like I can dedicate my life to it and I can spend all this time. But how do I make money? How do I profit? I'm not supposed to be transactional, and, but the long term, you know, you're telling me I might have to invest years or at least months before I can maybe make an ask of people so that they really know who I am and respect me and I have a deep understanding of, uh, of who I am and, and what my intentions are. But how do I make money? This is where I tell everyone, this is not a philanthropic enterprise. I'm not preaching don't be a nonprofit, okay? I'm preaching respecting people allows for them to respect you. So I'm going to tell one quick story, if you don't mind, Darrell. Please. Um, and it will be, how do you actually take this, put it into something that makes sense to make money? And it goes by, uh, it goes a little like this. There's a man named Derek Kober. Derek is a wealth manager. He also owns a uh, networking organization, or as he calls it, an unnetworking organization in Washington, D.C. called Cadre. Um, and, you know, basically, if you look at the historical norms of the uh, wealth management industry, referrals, right, a key driver of business, are usually in the single digits of someone's overall portfolio of clients. They're not very talkative, right? The super wealthy are not looking to talk about money. Um, you know, there's a lot of studies that show why. But Derek was always in some of the highest percentages in the United States in terms of referral. Well, he had a commodity business. Sure, he's smart, but in his mind, smart doesn't make the difference. So what did he do? Well, he relied on wine. So basically, Derek wanted to ensure that he was going to get amazing people that also, by the way, were the right kinds of people for him to be associating with. So he started a wine event. Now, this was a very high-end wine. This is not like you go buy a $10 bottle or a $10 glass. This is the kind of wine that you have to have special sommeliers and people that really understand the palate. And he had a certain set of rules. He would invite his clients and he would have one caveat. You're allowed to invite one person to this event, but that person must understand wine and have a deep respect and passion for wine because these wines are some of the most select, amazing, and so forth. Now, what did he do there? He basically figured out a way to reverse engineer people in his exact target market coming to his event at an invitation of a friend while basically having all of the nuance that he's a wealth manager, uh, that he's done well for his clients, all that be spoken of not by him, not in a presentation, he never pitched, 
but by be spoken to uh, by their friends, people they respected. Come to an event where they're going to have an amazing experience, likely end up in a conversation with Derek after they have all this context. And in the end, what's going to happen? A certain percentage of those people are going to come up to Derek and be like, you know, my wealth manager doesn't do this stuff for me. We should be talking. Can I get your number? Can I talk to you? Mm. Welcome to how Derek became incredibly successful. Mm. So my point to everyone here is these philosophies and frameworks, because Derek was not making, he could have easily said the criteria is I need everybody to have $25 million in assets. That's not what he did. He picked something they cared deeply about that he cared deeply about and set the proper stage and the right table that everyone benefited. He gets benefits through great people attending his events. That makes sense. They benefit from the potential of meeting a provider that wasn't that typical pushy uh, person that you would meet as a service provider in the wealth management industry. That's always trying to direct dial. And he did it methodically. And he won. There's an example for your audience of how to make money, but do it the right way. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> because ah, it's so good. It's so good. Right. Because also he's thinking about who are the people and I'm assuming I'm, I, I, I don't I like wine, but I probably am not a sommelier level at all. But if you're interested in that kind of stuff, then you probably have a more sophisticated taste. So it's a way of getting because if you know your audience well, you can put together things based on their interests that would give you a higher percentage of yield that the people who are attending are people who are going to like your flow and are going to be able to be good customers. It's, it's actually brilliant. It's brilliant. Yeah, I think so. And these are some of the things we talk about in the book. So my ask to the audience is very simple. And for giving an hour of hopefully content that we can all use, I hope some of you take a look at this book again, not because I'm trying to sell you a product, but because I believe it can truly help you make the difference in your relationship building efforts. And I wish you all the best of luck. Yeah. And I, you know, I can't stress this enough. You can't highlight a podcast, you know, you can't dog eat your podcast, but you can with a book. But if you like audio books, they have the book. I just, I can't stress enough. I'm, I've seen Scott do his thing for a very, very long time and he is extremely knowledgeable and his partner, Ryan Pohl is, uh, is an incredible human being who has a lot of background in this as well. So I would highly recommend everyone go to superconnectorbook.com to get a copy of the book. We'll have a link in the show notes so you can get a copy of that. You've been, um, incredibly, uh, just awesome, Scott. And I have to say this because I say it on every podcast is very important. The information that Scott just shared with you will not impact or influence or help you in any way. The application of this information is what transforms your life. So I want you to think about what did you hear? What was the ideas? What was the philosophy? What was the strategy that meant the most to you that you're going to start absorbing into your life right now? Because that is how the game gets changed. That is how you make a difference in, the, in your life and the lives of others and live a more super connected versus transactional life. So thank you so, so much, Scott, for being with us today. Thank you for having me. All right. You are awesome. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Make sure to subscribe to our podcast, The Art of Likeability, and reach out with any questions you have. Until next time, remember, my friend, you are awesome.